A message from Farmer Leaf. Things never go as planned on a tea trip. Always take a spare tire with you. Just before the spring harvest in Jingmai, we went to Jinggu area. This is a five hour drive from poor city. We never visited that place before. Now the naming system can be quite confusing in Yunnan. There are three things that are called Jinggu. There is Jinggu County, which is about the size of Monghai. Then there's Jinggu City, which is also the size of Monghai City. And then there is a small town in the north of Jinggu City, which is called Small Jinggu. Now there is tea all over the Jinggu County, but usually when tea enthusiasts refer to Jinggu tea, they refer to Small Jinggu tea. Small Jinggu is a small town about the same size as Mongku, and it is surrounded by mountain ranges on the east, south and west, and by a big lake on the north. We spent three days exploring the area. The schedule was a bit tight because we had to go to Jingmai to start our tea production run. But during our stay, we managed to visit the three main mountain ranges and got a good idea of how tea is made there. So let's start with the most famous area, Wenshanding. You can see this name on tea cakes. Originally, I thought it was a village name, but it turns out that it's the mountain range in the east. The most famous village there is definitely Kudzhushan. And when you go to Jinggu town and you're looking for tea, they will say you should go to Kudzhushan because this is the most famous tea of the area. So there we went. On the first day, we drove east and headed for Kudzhushan. And you don't see many tea gardens until you reach the middle of the mountain. So as you go uphill, you see more and more tea gardens. And when you reach the area around Zhao Xiaobi and Kudzhushan, then the whole place is covered in tea gardens. You also have some forests at higher altitude, but from the road, you cannot see much going on in those forests. So let's first focus on what we saw around Kudzhushan. We saw two kinds of tea gardens. One looks like what we call Taidichha, in Yunnan, it refers to conventional tea plantations with tea trees densely planted and the pruning done at waist height to make the picking easier. So you can see carpets of tea leaves and terraces. This type of garden in Jinggu is planted with the Tabaichha varietal. It's a clonal varietal which is unique to Jinggu and partly makes the reputation of Jinggu tea. They make very beautiful buds with a lot of hair and very large leaves, which means that they are often used for making white tea and black tea. And you'll find tons of them in the wholesale tea markets of poor city. For the avid tea enthusiast, it's not a really interesting tea. It's just good looking. I can understand that it can sell well on the mass market and in cheap tea shops, but you don't find much in terms of taste there. It's pretty bland. I remember in 2010, there was a time when they would make poor tea with that and they would heavily promote it in the Kunming tea markets. But it seems that since then they have reverted back to making beautiful looking white and blacks because maybe it caters more to that kind of tea drinkers. The second type of tea gardens that you can see around Kudzhushan is made of the old varietal. Now the old varietal, you will find it everywhere in Yunnan, but it's not a clonal varietal. It just means that the tea trees are reproduced by seeds and therefore they will have their own gene pool and that old varietal will be different in every area you go. But there is something special about the old varietal and the technique used in Jinggu. They do what we call Tang Tiao Cha. So to make Tang Tiao Cha, it's a combination of picking methods and pruning techniques. When you pick the tea, you want to pick all the leaves on the side of the branches. And during the maintenance time of your tea garden, you also want to pick out the buds that would grow new branches. So you want to promote long branches and not lateral growth. This is quite unusual because in most places in the world, you want to promote the lateral growth because it will give you some thicker bushes with a higher yield. And I've only seen this uh, Tang Tiao technique used in Jinggu and in the eastern side of Mongku. It's not really clear what advantage it gives to the tea farmer. You can let your opinions in the comment section of this video. So we arrived in Kudzhushan, and as you can expect for a famous village, the houses were pretty big and there were large factories set up everywhere. And the place was totally covered in tea gardens of both varietals. But around the village, I must say, we could find more of the Tang Tiao Cha than of the Tabai Cha. Most farmers in Jinggu grow both varietals, 
and it's quite smart because they cater to different markets. The Tabai Cha caters to the mass market. It has a cheap price and a high yield, and it's quite a consistent harvest all over the year. While the Teng Tiao Cha caters to the premium market, you sell at a high price, but you have a lower yield, and it takes a bit more uh, workforce to pick the tea. We visited a few farms there, but the quality was a bit disappointing. You could say it wasn't better than anything you can find in the wholesale tea market in poor city. Not terrible, but nothing special really. And this is often what uh, tea drinkers think of Jingu tea. It's a cheap daily drinker with no special character, just a sweet taste. We finished the day by driving east and we almost reached Zhenyuan County. And at this point there was no tea garden in sight, so we headed back to Jingu town. On the second day, we had arranged an appointment with one of our contacts around Jingu. We sourced the tea from a relative of the farmer last year. It's Tangfang Liangzi area, so it's a mountain in the southwest of Jingu. Tangfang Liangzi refers to a famous tea garden which is on top of that mountain. And the tea we sourced does not come from that famous tea garden. But as I can see on the map, the whole mountain is called Tangfang Liangzi. So that's how we have decided to name the tea. And so he gives us a meeting point which is quite far from where the tea gardens are. It's a group of villages in the southwest of Jingu. So we drive around a bit on tiny roads and eventually we find him. Then he takes us through smaller roads and at some point we arrive at the bottom of the mountain and it's a dirt track and our car cannot go. So we park and we start walking uphill. So we have to follow that farmer uphill and he's literally running up there. So we kind of break a sweat to arrive there. And after 40 minutes of forced march, we finally reach the tea gardens. And there, when you finally reach the tea gardens, you get your reward. You're surrounded by beautiful nature. You have a great view on Jingu town and the tea gardens exceeded our expectations. They really look like the tea gardens you could find in Eastern Yiwu or in Laos. Uh, you could call that forest tea because the tea trees are growing very near or in the forest. So it really contrasts with what we saw on the first day in uh, Wenshanning area because there all the tea gardens were in open field and now we're in Tangfang Liangzi and we can enjoy that uh, good biodiversity in the tea gardens. And we can see that the tea trees are not densely planted so it's a really low yield uh, management. The soil is not tilled, which is uh, very different from what's usually practiced uh, around Jingu. They like to till the soil every year. We also do that in Jingmai to an extent, but maybe not every year. So we really don't regret that that farmer was running there because uh, it was a sight to see. And we spent a good time walking around several tea gardens in the area. Then we headed back to the car and we went to his house. And there we had a really nice tea session. Now, unfortunately, he didn't have a lot of samples. It's quite interesting that uh, some farmers don't really keep samples of their production. During our stay in his home, we learned that unlike uh, Monghai area or Jingmai, the tea processing skill was never lost in Jingu. It means that he started processing tea when he was young and his parents were doing it and his grandparents were doing it. So we can expect quite a high skill level in terms of uh, shatching skill and poor tea making skill in Jingu area. It's not the case in Monghai or Jingmai because in the 90s the production was kind of rationalized so they, they made these big processing units and the average farmers didn't process the tea anymore. So usually the, um, the older generations in that area they don't really know how to make good tea. So it's quite interesting that in Jingu they managed to keep those traditions. And in some way you can see the parallel with Iwu Mountain in that regard. It also means that in Jingu it's quite standard to give your specifications as to how you want the tea process to the tea farmers. We don't really like doing that, we prefer when the processing type comes from the farmer's initiative. So we tend not to give uh, clear instructions to the farmers, we prefer when the, the passion of the farmer and his own opinions come out in the tea. And of course, we like to work with farmers who to some extent share our vision of tea. 
but it's always nice to know that there's a level of control over the processing in Jingu area. So we went back to the hotel, Yubai and the kid rested in the room, and I wanted to find more. So that farmer that we had just met mentioned Jiotaipo as a famous but kind of exclusive tea garden where the tea is very expensive, and I wanted to visit this area. So I checked on my phone, I checked on the map, and I saw it was in the south of Jingu town. So I said, okay, let's drive there. And I saw a village close to Jiotaipo, so I drove to that village. So it was on the main road. And when I arrived to the village, I was uh, a bit surprised because there was no tea in sight. And it turns out that Jiotaipo is on the other side of the mountain and there is no road to access Jiotaipo from uh, that village. So that was a bit frustrating, but it's usually when things don't go according to plan that you really start exploring and that you make your best discoveries. I chose to keep driving on that main road to the next town, which is uh, called Minla, and which is a bit far from Jingu, but the road was good and the landscape looked really nice. So I kept driving and to my surprise, there was even more tea in Minla than in small Jingu and uh, it was all Tabai Cha, so it was all conventional terrace tea plantations everywhere with no biodiversity at all and now I understand where all these very fury buds that you can see in the poor tea market come from. They make it in white and in black, you also have some one bud one leaf, uh, there's a lot of this tea on the market. So interestingly Minla is a dye town so it gives you that uh, Shishuang Bana vibe that uh, you're always happy to encounter, especially when you're not in Sichuan Bana, and it was pretty hot because it was a very low altitude. So I was in Minla and it was getting quite late. A reasonable person would have gone back to Jingu, but I'm not a reasonable person, I'm a tea explorer, and despite having visited nice tea gardens in the morning, I wanted to see more on that day. So I kept going. I went north, I checked the map, and so Minla is in the west of Jingu, and so between Jingu and Minla, there is that huge mountain range. So my plan would be to drive north and go all around that mountain range and somehow find some roads to get back to Jingu from the north. There was no major road indicated on the map, but I'm sure I was gonna find a way to get back to Jingu. And so I drove north from Minla and so even more Tabai Cha. Tabai Cha really everywhere, even in the plain. It's very rare to see tea planted in the flatlands in Yunnan, which means that, that Tabai Cha must be a really good money maker for the farmers, because usually at low altitude, you, you're better off planting fruits. So I kept driving north and I was keeping a look at the big mountain range that was on my right. And finally, I started climbing that mountain range and I could open the windows and enjoy cool breeze in this late afternoon. There were very few villages along the way. I reached the hamlet and I saw a large greenhouse that covered the top of the house, which usually indicates that uh, people make tea there. So I stopped, I got off the car and I went in the tea factory. I met a young guy there. He left me some samples of poor tea, telling me that there was tea up in the forest, but it was the late afternoon and I didn't have time for a new hike. So I took the samples I gave a bit of money. I like to pay for my samples because it's good not to abuse the farmer's time. And before leaving, he told me to head back to Minla because the road is gonna stop in a few kilometers. I didn't listen to him because they always tell you the road is bad, but you can most often make it through. And he was right. The road stopped and it was a dirt track. And there I was honing my rallying skill with an old sedan. But if you take it slowly, if it's not the rainy season, you can always go without problem. The area was scarcely inhabited. I only saw a couple of houses and at some point I ended up in a corner and I thought it was really the end of the road and I was totally stuck there. But it turned out that uh, you went through a farm courtyard and the road kept going on. But actually I stopped in the farm because there was a, a nice old man there. There were only two older people in the farm the parents were taking the kids back to school and that might explain why I didn't see much activity in the villages. So I had a look at the tea factory and it looked kind of old and dusty. They were producing all kinds of tea. Honestly, it didn't look very good, but it's interesting to see that uh, in such a remote place, you can find a factory that will also produce green tea and black tea 
and also to our tea. Now, I didn't take samples there because honestly the, the tea didn't look very good and the factory uh, looked a bit dirty. But it was interesting to get that feel that takes us back 10 years ago when all the factories were like this, when it was not really professionalized. At that time it was getting dark, so I was in a hurry to really find a way back to Jingu. And it wasn't sure I was going to find one because that dirt track kept going on with no exit in sight. And it was a really good way to end the day, you know, to go through these windy roads, go slowly or sometimes even, even faster uh, while the sun was setting at fairly high altitude and with a plume of dust behind the car because it was all sand. And finally, I could see the lake that's in the north of Jingu and I made my way back to the main road and I went back to the hotel. On the third day, it was time to go back to poor city because we still had things to prepare for the spring harvest in Jing Mai. But I was a bit frustrated that I hadn't managed to go to Jiutaipo. So I checked the map and it turns out that the right way to go was from the south of Jingu. And conveniently, it was on the, on the way back. So I said, well, we can just make a detour and go check there and then go back home. It will only take an hour, right? We always say that on tea trips. Eventually, we spend the whole afternoon there because what we found would really raise our standard and our view of Jingu by a whole new level. Again, as soon as we exited the main road, it was all dirt tracks and it really reminded us of northern Laos and our missions in northern Laos in those more remote and less densely populated areas. We went through a couple of villages with no tea in sight, so we kept going and we kept looking at the mountains and we really couldn't see much tea gardens in the mountains. We stopped in a village at the end of the road. We parked the car on the basketball court. This is the default parking spot in the small villages of rural Yunnan. And as we were parking, we saw a really beautiful greenhouse which looked brand new. So we decided to go there. And there, there was a festival. It wasn't a big village, so there were maybe 50 people attending. You know, the usual countryside festival where the men are busy chopping meat while the women are preparing the seasoning and washing all the vegetables and the children running around and the elders maybe playing cards or smoking, sitting on benches. This is why I like living in Yunnan. So we entered the tea factory and we met a very well-mannered man called Luo Kaiyin. And so we sat at the tea table, he invited us for a cup of tea and there we were at noontime drinking tea in a nice setting in a small village in the middle of nowhere, surrounded by beautiful hills covered in forests. Luo Kaiyin seemed to be a man of culture and his attitude quite contrasted with the location we were in. We were in a fairly remote place, about an hour drive from the main road, and it was quite refreshing to have some deep tea discussions with him over a good cup of tea. The tea he brewed for us was by far the best one we had had in the past three days. He explained to us that the tea gardens were very remote from the village. It's very much like Guafongjai in Niu Mountain. You have to walk for up to two hours from the village to reach the tea gardens. He took us to the most accessible one, which was just opposite the village on a nearby hill. It wasn't the most forested tea garden, but it was all surrounded by nature and the tea trees looked quite healthy quite big and not so pruned, so you have to climb on some of the trees to harvest them. In Jingu, we didn't see massive tea trees like you would have in Monghai area, but Luo Kaiyin says they exist, and he actually goes to remote places far from his village to source them. This day, with the great teas he brewed for us and the deep conversation we had about tea, Luo Kaiyin earned our trust and we decided to feature several of his teas on our website this year. Lokayin in his tea factory sources tea from different tea gardens. Some of them are located around his village, but he also goes as far as Wenshanding, the mountain we visited on the first day, and also at the border with uh, Zhenyuan, a far in the north from Jinggu, where he says there are really big trees in the forest, and he likes to make the teas as single trees. So when we ordered tea from him, they all came in separate bags and each of the bag was one single tree harvest. Some of the bags, especially for the ones that were close to Genuine, came with four or five kilos per bag. 
which means that they must be really big trees. When we produce single tree tea in Jing Mai, we usually get one or two kilo per tree. But I must admit that the trees in Jing Mai are not that big. So I hope this year you will enjoy the tea that he's making. We found some similarities with Iwu tea in the way that it's not very bitter. It's all in the mouth feel, the hui gan and the body feel. These teas have excellent cha tea and it really coats the mouth. It's a bit oily, really like olive oil and it's uh, very pleasant. You, you still have the character of basic Jinggu tea, but it's upgraded. You won't find that much complexity in the fragrance. It's really all about the sweetness and how it goes through the mouth. So it's very pleasant teas and we're really happy to feature them this year on our website. And there it was. The lunch was ready when we came back from the tea gardens. We enjoyed a great meal in the village and then we headed back to Jinggu city and the next day we went back to Puer city. So overall it was a short but very dense and satisfying trip and we're really happy to better understand how tea is made in Jinggu. So to summarize, you have three kinds of tea in Jinggu. You have the Tabai Cha, which is for the mass market with beautiful leaves. You have the basic Tang Piao Cha, which is grown in open fields and is kind of a medium entry level poor tea. And finally, you have the forest tea, which is similar to what you can find in Eastern Yiwu and Northern Laos, and which was the most satisfying tea we had on that trip. You can really taste the nature in that tea and that kind of experience really reminds us why we're into this business. Every trip is filled with discoveries and we're really happy to have taken that trip. That's it for today. Thank you for watching and I hope you will enjoy the tea. See you later.